Hi, my name is Lucy Norman and I live on the south coast of New South Wales, Australia and I'm here to talk to you about the colony of grey-headed flying foxes that has set up in Batemans Bay. The first bats in this colony arrived about six years ago and the colony has recently grown significantly in numbers because we have had a big season of flowering spotted gums. They have been driven here from other colonies and their natural habitat has been removed. As I talk to you today, I'm going to keep a tally of my opinions and facts that I'm going to tell you. The facts that I'm going to tell you are just that. They are facts and if you don't like them, then I'm, I'm sorry about that. But um, there is nothing that I can do about that. The facts are as they are. The first thing I'm going to write on my tally is that I understand that the people in Batemans Bay are finding the bats to be awful. They, I, I visited the, the main colony yesterday, the roost at the water gardens, and I think I must have got them on a very good day because there was no noticeable smell. There was very little noticeable sound. I was speaking with a journalist from the post. We could hear each other very well. They were creating no nuisance or disturbance at all. I could see that the, the foliage looked fine, reasonably undisturbed. There was abundant bird life. There were at least 20 or 30 ducks. So rumours that I've heard of the utter bat apocalypse or the bat megeddon seem to me to be a little overblown. However, I'm willing to accept just on the apocryphal evidence that I have been given on Facebook that the colony is causing a problem that is awful. At times the smell is intolerable, um, children's outside play equipment is unusable, people's washing, people's cars, um, and that's fine. That is an opinion. I've got it on the table as being an opinion, and I accept it, and I've heard it, and I understand that it is a really bad problem. It's an inconvenience, and it's noted. The first fact that I would like to outline is that that grey-headed flying fox colony represents 20% of the entire species. 20% of the species, that's all that's left. There's um, colonies between Queensland and Victoria, but this one represents 20% of every flying, flying fox on the planet. It's a species that's found nowhere else in the world, just Australia, and we have a fifth of all of them. I would like to point out that within 25 to 100 years, researchers expect this species to be extinct, no longer flying in the skies, functionally gone from the face of the planet. Okay. Um, I have had a lot of arguments with people on Facebook about the extreme health risks that are posed by the flying foxes. I've been reading a lot of very impassioned um, diatribes about health and safety and diseases, bat diseases that are flying up the hallways of Batemans Bay Hospital, Ebola, rabies, and I would like to set straight some of the health and safety concerns about the flying foxes. Yes, some of the flying foxes may carry the Lyssa virus. This is different from rabies, it is not the same thing. There is no rabies in Australia. No rabies in Australia, I promise. Lista virus is similar, but only three people have ever caught it. In the history of the entire disease, only three. It's true that some, some flying foxes may carry the Hendra virus. Hendra virus is also extremely rare. There was one outbreak that was quite bad a few years ago. Hendra virus cannot communicate directly from a bat to a human being. Not possible. It has to go through a carrier first. Um, we believe that that may be horses. 70 horses died in an outbreak a few years back. But only seven people have ever caught Hendra virus. Seven in the history of the entire disease. So we're looking at a total of 10 people in the history, in the known history of these diseases that have ever been affected. And those are really, really low numbers. In fact, 
you are statistically more likely to not only be bitten by a shark, you're more likely to be kicked to death by a cow that has planned to do so in league with other cows. A coordinated cow attack is more likely to kill you than a bat disease. You are also, also statistically more likely to be killed by an icicle, by bumping into somebody, by a Christmas tree, or by your own bed. So, without meaning to sound facetious, the health and safety risks associated with bats are laughably low. I understand that the bats have been causing power outages, and that, again, is really unfortunate. Um, I'm really sorry for that. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. But um, the main thing that people have been bringing to my attention is people on life-saving devices, people on neat, critical machines, things like dialysis machines or ventilators. And I understand that intuitively, you would imagine in your mind People on these life-saving devices with a machine that's measuring a steady pulse and all of a sudden a bat hits a tower, there's fireworks and the lights go out and the machine goes off. And all of a sudden that, that machine is no longer functioning. There's no more breath moving in or out of that body. Um, maybe the power to the phone has gone so there's no way to call for help. Even if you could call for help, you might get to the hospital and find it dark with wards full of patients gasping their last because bats have taken power to necessary equipment. And as horrifying as that portrait is, it's intuitive, it's imaginative, it is not factual, that is not how it works. CPAP machines for sleep apnea, ventilators, dialysis machines, all of these things have internal redundancy supplies they all have emergency battery packs that can be fitted you can get multiple battery packs if you're concerned about the power being out for a significant amount of time when you register for your electricity service you should notify your provider that you are a person who is in need of uninterrupted power supply you can be on a register for that um, if you're in any doubt, you can speak to your healthcare provider. You can get support for uninterrupted power supply management from your primary healthcare network. I assure you, nobody is going to die in their bed because a bat hit a tower. It's a terrifying thought, but it is science fiction. It's not going to happen. That's not the reality of how it works. Um, Okay, I now need to talk to you about, so what are we going to do about it? The bat colony is here, the people are unhappy, so what can we do to try and resolve this conflict? Well, we can, a lot of people have suggested culling to me, which is not an option. These bats, because they are protected by federal law, because their numbers have been declining so rapidly, 30% of the entire species died out over a 10 year period. They are federally protected because their numbers are in rapid decline. Culling is not an option. It is not going to be sanctioned by governments. It is not ethically viable. It is not possible. So we'll take culling off of the table, which leaves us with the solution that most of the people in Batemans Bay are pushing for, which is to disperse the colony, to relocate the colony, which is fine. That is, um, that is a, logical, a logical thing to want to do, to redisperse the colony. Um, a report was prepared over the 17 relocation attempts that have been undertaken over a 13 year period. This report is publicly available and it states that of these 17 attempts, 16 were unilateral failures. They resulted in very expensive incursions into bat colonies. Um, some of the animals were injured and hurt. It didn't work out well for some of the colonies. But in the end, the colonies remained either in exactly the same area or in areas very close, maybe 600 meters away. So functionally, the experience of the bats, um, they had not moved. But you were still getting the same fly in, fly out, impacts, the same feces dropping, the same urine smell. It was functionally no different for all of the people who demanded that these 
that be relocated. Um, there has been a report prepared by uh, Council has engaged an independent consultant, Ecological, to develop a draft dispersal management plan. It's also available online. I would absolutely recommend that you go and read this document. It talks about different dispersal management solutions, um, their measures of success, their expected likelihoods and their costs. I would like to draw to your attention that if we were to undertake phase one, phase two and phase three of the Bat Colony Dispersal Plan, it would cost $6.2 million. $6.2 million for which the council is responsible, the Eurobadala Shire Council. Now they can put in applications for state or federal funding, but not only is the council financially responsible for relocation, it is responsible for relocation on a policy level. If the relocation fails, it is council's responsibility. They are accountable for that. They are responsible financially for any new areas that are then settled by the flying foxes who wish to apply for compensation. They open themselves up to a, a legal nightmare if they try and disperse this group, knowing that there's very limited likelihood that they're going to leave the Central Bay area. They're going to go to Long Beach, they're going to go to Catalina, they're going to stay right where the people of Batemans Bay are. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at this, and the report highlights this, that even if we were to spend the entire $6.2 million, the chances of success are really, really low. Really low. By my count, if 16 out of 17 attempts have failed, many of those had greater chance of success than this would. This has less than a 5% chance of succeeding the way that people would want it to. It is not a viable option. And I'm going to write that down as a fact, as a statistically proven fact from previous implementations of similar strategies that have not worked by the advice that we are being given on the proposed strategy that it will not work. We can assume that it is recommended to us by researchers who know what they're talking about, that from the past, from what we expect of the future, from what we know of this bat colony, dispersal will not work. It is a very expensive folly. It's a folly that we really can't afford. So, at the end of this, I would like to show you my tally of opinions and facts. On one side we have, this is 20% of a species in serious decline. They're 25 to 100 years away from extinction. They're vulnerable, they're threatened, they're found nowhere else in the world. We have a responsibility, an ecological responsibility, to try and maintain biodiversity. Every human being has that responsibility to try and make decisions with compassion and wisdom, with information that's based on facts. Only 10 people have ever been infected by a disease carried by fat. Power failures might be inconvenient, but they are not life critical. And dispersal of the colony will not work. It's very expensive. It won't work. It shouldn't be considered a viable option. On the opinion side, that's are awful. Now that to me seems really thin. Does that not seem thin to you? That in the face of all of this information, history, statistics, research, that the experience of, but they're awful, um, that seems weak. People are complaining of um, dropping house prices, dropping rental prices, um, being unable to go out and enjoy the activities that they usually enjoy. Human beings are blessed with really a lot of options, so many options. Council has subsidised use of pressure washers, of car tarps, of, lawn, of washing line covers for people who don't have anywhere else to hang their washing. I understand only something like 80 people have even made an application for assistance like that. I understand that 1,500 people have signed a petition to have the bats dispersed. 
but only 80 people have put in an application for any practical assistance for trying to learn to live with that peacefully. Um, people can park their car somewhere else, they can trade in for a bicycle, they can move. Human beings are blessed with infinite choices and the power to make those choices into a reality. The bats really only have two choices and that is to hope, to rely on the pity of a species that does not have a good track record of sticking up for animals, for sympathy, for compassion. That's, that's their first option, just hope to God that we don't persecute them or die. Just straight up die. It will be possible with enough work and effort to drive this species out of Bateman's Bay forever, to force them off into the forests, into the bushland. That's where they belong, isn't it? To the bush. Bushland. What bushland? What trees? What's their food source? Where, where is the food source for a colony this big? If someone was to displace a group of people, a hundred thousand group of people, and dump them into the middle of the forest and say, well, it's bushland, isn't it? You know, you can hunt, you can pick berries. How long would a colony of a hundred thousand people last, put into exactly the same position? That as long as the bats would. Put into an environment that they're not suited for, driven there by fear, because we're threatening guns and smoke and fire. Yeah, they'll leave. They'll leave terrified and they'll flee to the bush and they'll die. They'll die there. That's really what we're advocating. Um, so that's about the end of what I wanted to discuss. If you would like to add your voice to mine, um, you can find my petition online um, for the protection of vulnerable native flying foxes against attack by community and government. If you Google Lucy Norman and bats, I'm sure that some link on the internet will bring you right to me and bring you to my petition. If you would like to email the council who has direct responsibility for this matter, that would be the Yurubadulla Shire Council, and you can reach them at council at esc.newsouthwales.gov.au. Um, thank you very much for your time, um, and I really hope that you lend us your support.